Perfect. Okay, it's recording. All right. So yeah, feel free everyone just to jump in when whenever you want. Okay. I'm just gonna um, view full screen. Give me a sec. Oops. There we go. Awesome. You guys like that little, <laughs> little image. So as I said, my name's Nicole and I am um, part um, First Nation. So um, I'm a member of Stalo, um, uh, Stalo Nation, uh, which is um, located along the Fraser River. Obviously Stalo means um, people of the river and I'm from uh, the Lacamel Band. And I also have some ancestry within um, Squamish Nation, Squamish Nation. Um, and yeah, and so for the past few years, you know, I've been really interested in, um, you know, different indigenous plants um, and reconnecting to land and also nature. And a big part of that for me was um, planting these things in my garden. Now, I don't have a lot of space. I have a tiny little balcony, um, but on that balcony, I do definitely try to really focus on um, planting um, either pollinator plants, right? Um, and also, um, other indigenous plants, things that I can use for myself and also my family. So, you know, medicinal plants. So this is a photo of um, our little balcony at um, Emily Core University. I recently graduated from there and it's kind of up high. It's like a little, um, you know, escape for students. And it's just such a beautiful area to be in and to relax and come out, you know, during all kinds of, um, you know, times of the, of the uh, semester. And, you know, the school was really um, interested in planting pollinator plants, so plants that would really help um, pollinators come by. And so actually throughout this, um, the year, the plants up here actually change. So, you know, in summer, a lot of them are flowers, right? Pollinator plants. And then throughout the other months, they have other, you know, plants that grow such as like vegetables or herbs or spices, things like that, um, that they then kind of give to students to either use in art projects or, or food or, you know, whatnot. So it's a really amazing um, little space. And you can see that um, you know, we don't have a lot of room, but we use that room, um, that space accordingly. So, you know, we don't have a lot of every plant, but you'll see several different types of flowers in each box. And I really think that that's quite beautiful and, and really um, making use of that space. Um, okay, so, and as you can see here, this is what we would call like a pollinator pathway. <clears throat> and so for anyone who's, you know, a little confused on what a pollinator pathway is, it's basically just a strip of land. It could be in your garden. It could be, you know, out front of your house. Um, it could be anywhere. It could be in a park. And it's just like, a, a, it doesn't have to be too wide, but it's usually a bit long and it kind of allows um, pollinator, um, at, you know, either hummingbirds, bees, butterflies, any kind of, you know, bug that helps pollinate um, to kind of go from flower to flower undisrupted. And that's really important because a lot of the times, you know, um, especially if you're in um, really dense areas like downtown, there's not a lot of space for these pollinators to to fly, you know, safely from plant to plant. And so creating this kind of long, almost highway for them really allows uh, them to a, access that food and that, that resource, um, as well as it looks, you know, gorgeous. And um, having that variety there too is really important. So you can see that while there are pretty distinct strips, they do blend together kind of on the edges. And this is just another example of some of like the more wild or organic, um, you know, gardening that we've done uh, at Emily Carr. And again, I wasn't part of this part, um, but I, you know, did see it and, and we used this outdoor space a lot. And it was more about just working with the curves of the land, working with the natural kind of ups and downs, the hills, and really letting the plants grow. Um, unfortunately, they've, you know, cut a lot of it down now and it's just green grass now. Um, but for, you know, two years, they just let these plants 
um, grow and and kind of just kind of uh, come with the seasons. And what I was telling Maddie and Leanne before we started was that uh, what was really cool is that you know kind of to this side, um, not really close to the school, but to the to the right hand side, um, it's just grass, right? But during the summer months, they like I said, let it grow. And every couple of weeks was a new different type of flower. So they planted a ton of different flowers. Obviously a lot of work went into this, but they looked at what time each flower um, blooms, right? And so, you know, early on it would be like lupins. And then later on it would be like poppies. And then later into the season it would be black eyed Susans or cone flowers. And it was just gorgeous to see all these flowers kind of come in these waves. And, you know, one would kind of die and the other one would be blooming. And it was kind of changing this like different color of the field every couple of months. And it was absolutely breathtaking. I wish there was a photo that I had of it, but uh, I loved it. Um, and Maddie, definitely, and Leanne, um, if Cece is here, definitely feel free to jump in. I don't wanna <laughs> hog up um, the time. <laughs> Um, yeah, and so, you know, we're just looking at, um, you know, different types of these, these wild plantings and, and kind of letting flowers kind of, you know, take over that natural space and not having that, you know, linear system of like one row, two row, three rows that you often see so much in gardens. So, you know, I'm curious. Um, you know, does anyone have any questions? I mean, we can keep going for sure. Uh, Maddie, do you have anything to kind of add? I know you've been working a lot in the plant nursery. Sure, well, um, one thing that I've been thinking of recently is I, I've actually been learning a whole lot this year about pollinators, which is sort of an exciting new um, field for me. Um, and one, one thing that has been in my mind recently because of seeing new a few new blossoms coming out is in the very early spring uh, bumblebee queens will emerge from hibernation and they need food and so um, this bloom succession that you were talking about is super important for pollinators because some of them emerge really early in the spring and then some of them just have different um, times of year that they're they're active and so having a, a sort of a bloom succession where there's always something going in the garden is important um, and then another uh, thing that I've learned about pollinator preferences is that you they like it when you plant and I think you can see it in this image a bit plant in drifts so have a, a fairly several plants of the same species and a large patch of them because that lets them forage more efficiently they, they can find their their plant and then go between the flowers exactly and i think also it just looks good to me yeah um, and that was kind of like this uh past image i don't know if it's if i can get to it now but um oh sorry uh oh backwards uh this one right here where you're that, that's the drifts kind of you're talking about where it's you know you can see those distinct lines right and again they, they are blended right a little bit but you can see that there's like three or four distinct flowers and and having those there so yeah no i i love that um i just want to um say that cease is here in the room so cease we've just been talking for just a few minutes now um but just uh let us know we're we've just been talking about um kind of pollinator pathways so having flowers um you know, in, in certain places or certain um, um, ways that uh, help pollinators um, as well as, yeah, that's pretty much, we haven't gone too far. Um, so definitely uh, jump in whenever you want. And I was talking a little bit about this garden here at Emily Carr where um, it's really natural. They've kind of gone with like the, the curves of the space and really allowed it to be a lot more organic. Um, at least it used to be quite uh, more with their flowers every season. Um, so yeah, definitely jump in if you want. Cool. Um, sure. Yeah, I I missed part of the beginning, but from what I can see, it's like just you know talking, making references to attracting the uh, the butterflies, the pollinators. This is a great 
drawing a great example of, you know, bunch growing, but also kind of, you know, I, I have to say like the, the blend, the blends that, um, that Anne Riley and I used last summer at the Hastings garden was a whole mix. And we, they were all the, it was the same blend, but spread over two acres. And so it was like a blend of different ones and it really held out well too. And it could be, if you could actually do both, you could do these bunch growings and then kind of sprinkle in between like a blend that then edits it and gives it this really, I don't know, other level of sweet organic lines. And you can also apparently, um, you know, put uh, an image or uh, you can use some of the flowers depending on their height and the allisums, which are big for hummingbirds and other pollinators. They don't grow too high, but we did a, we actually wrote out the, the letters for Anya and did drone shots. It was really cool. I think I have a photo of the Anya. Yeah, it's a little blurry. Sorry, but <laughs> this is yeah. Bad. And see that's a good example so it's just like a really great seed blend of pollinator rich um indigenous species that are just it's like a meadow we gave this meadow effect over this two acre zone and it had like huge concentration of pollinators and beneficials like all these um these ladybugs it was almost like a ladybug farm there there were so many ladybugs like on everything and so they just loved it. They appeared on their own. Um, and then it was almost like they'd been searching for Utopia and found it and just like, whoosh. we added, um, you know, mason bees. And uh, we also noticed honeybees from the local hives in the area. We noticed tons of bumblebees, big fat ones, really, really big fat ones. and. Other pollinators that we didn't see much. So, you know, and then we did the butterfly release. So it was a really rich garden that sustained uh, many things and it was remediation. This is a remediation garden. So everything mm. is working to cleanse and rebuild mm. that soil. And then there's, you know, like to the right of that, you don't see it in the picture, but is uh, the beginning of the beginnings of the tobacco mounds. And so they oh, also- wow big butterflies and the leaves were like this wide and this this long they were quite large and um but everything in there in the mix uh of things gave it this really pretty effect and gave it a really nice lush uh environment and so like you can't see it from the ground but it's a bit more sparse than the bunch gardens that you were showing so mm -hmm. it's just thinking that these mixes because they're so pretty and different um, different levels of heights uh, they become a you could actually do you could kind of spread your seeds and like design so they plant up in circles or squares or whatever if you wanted to be kind of fun about it um, yeah. or if it's like you know what I mean it doesn't have to be those things it could be yeah. cultural uh, like Coast Salish uh, forms and yeah, I, have a, I don't have a photo of what it looked like but um your garden I think was it with 221a again I can't remember yeah so that's definitely all we used wattles to to we use straw wattles to create the shapes of the bed so that they would um so that they would have the uh you know the specific uh like it looked like two Coast Salish eyes from above so Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and um, <clears throat> right before you joined us, talking about at Emily Carr and that grass area that's kind of beside it, and not anymore, unfortunately, they've just replaced it with plain grass. <laughs> but before, oh, no. um, you know, when we first moved in there for the first year or so, um, they had they kind of let all that grass grow, just wild almost. And then yeah. in the summer, they planted um, multiple kinds of um, wildflowers. So they had like lupins, they had I think, poppies, and then like two other ones. And then near the end, it was like black eyed Susan and comb flowers. And it was amazing because they're kind of spread all over the place. And when mm -hmm. one flower like lupins, which are kind of an earlier 
one to come up. Um, once they kind of started going away, then the next one started to bloom and, and so on. It was this beautiful kind of wave or transition. And I, I kind of going off what you said of like, you can plant in circles, you could plant, you know, this is a Coast Salish eye from above. I'm sorry, I couldn't get a photo of that, but- um, That's all right. Uh, yeah, so I was, you know, I was thinking of that as well, where it's almost this wave of different flowers or plants that are blooming at different times. Amazing. Yeah. Um, um, someone in I the just, chat asked a question. Um, I, did, I did just answer a question there. Oh, sweet. The blends came from West Coast Seeds, um, Butterfly Blend, Hummingbird Blend, Bee Blend. Perfect. And then someone said, any suggestions for early flowers to feed queen bees? And oh, oh yeah, always, always good one. Somebody wrote a few things there. I didn't see who wrote that, but. Yeah, I think Sandberry, I have... Indian Plum, Red Flower and Curry. <laughs> yes, sorry, Maddie, you can go right ahead and you want to, if you want to explain those. Oh, there's there, those are just a few things that came to mind. I've seen um, the first three blooming already. Um, there's the odd salmonberry peeking out, um, and Oregon grape will be coming along shortly. Uh, can you think of any other ones that are good for early spring? Um, well, what we have in Harmony Garden, which has been our best best success for wild. Uh, pollinators as well as our honeybees is the hazelnut trees mm. because the catkins are just loaded with like really rich pollen and so that's actually carrying them through the they can just like go and pollinate that and uh, it's it's just utterly amazing for them it's a good hit of We've seen them just hovering all over just the hazelnut bush in January, right? December and January. It's like, the first time I was like, what are they doing? Oh, wow. <laughs> like it's so full of pollen. Like, so that's a good one. We have a little witch hazel tree. It's not indigenous to here, but it's a really good one for winter. It flowers in January and February. So it's another one. And of course the snowdrops are apparently a fantastic hummingbird feed, um, food feed, whatever, however you wanna say it. And so those are just some other ones. And then now the, the red flowering currant and plum are starting to pop out. So we have a little plum tree in our garden, a little native plum, and it's just loaded. It, it, all the flowers popped up about a week and a half ago. And just as the hazelnut, uh, hazelnut catkins are starting to dry up, then, so it's like things go in succession, but you know, so you definitely wanna have a hazelnut tree in your garden for, if anything else, for the winter time mm -hmm. to assure that your pollinators get a good feed and uh, it's a good dose of food for them and they bring it back and, you know, they actually, produce all kinds of stuff with that. They can produce honey, they can uh, create sugars out of that that keep them going for, you know, when now it's like late March and we're, it's, it seems like it's a little bit late for the plum this year, mm -hmm. but, and for the uh, red flowering current, but as a, you know, as somebody that has been trying to monitor what to grow to feed uh all kinds of pollinators late in the fall and early in the you know like through the winter and early spring and that's the whole point is always you know look at what the flowering times are for things and when you're seeding things like uh cosmos are fantastic they'll take the whole summer to grow and then they'll they'll continue into november and december to be these gorgeous flowers and if you plant them in the right area, then with a little bit of cover, if there's ever a heavy rainstorm in November, they won't fall over. And uh, then you're guaranteed to keep feeding your pollinators like November, uh, sometimes even December, right? Depends on the weather and if it's mild, then yeah, you'll get longer, but always think about these things. And then an interesting thing to note is that the, um, there's a couple of types of Mahonias, the Nervosa and the um, Millifolia, I think. 
uh, or aquafolium and nervosa. Yeah, so those two. And one of them, I think the aquafolium is the one that uh, it starts to flower in January and February. So that's a really early pollinator. And then the other one flowers in June, between June and August, somewhere in there. And then, so you get, the, you get berries from both plants. They're the same. And the flowers are just really chock full of good, uh, really good nutrients. And of course, the next thing coming up is super delicious for all these birds and bees, which is the maple flowers that are going to start yeah. to show. And they are like so delicious. I totally get why the birds love them. They I are. ate one flowers last year and it was like having like, you know, those candies with the sugar uh, sweet filling that's inside that's soft yeah. you get a hard candy with a soft super sugary <laughs> thing it's that that my sweet. brother and I made um maple flower pancakes yep They're yeah really fritters good. pancakes you can you know Panko. You can, yeah so you can pick them and throw them in your freezer and have them People uh, it's better to make them into something and freeze them and then have them and then of course um you know, you can make uh, all kinds of things. There's recipes out now for those. Mm. So, and so um, that comes out. Yeah, definitely. I, I would definitely suggest people to go um, look uh, maple blossom flower. Um, and they're good. And they're pretty easy to they're come by. Tasty. And if you look closely at the flowers, they're red and yellow, which is our all, it's like a tonic. So it's good medicine for you too. And yeah. yeah, it's not just delicious, <laughs> also nutritious. Exactly. <laughs> um, and I was going to say um, uh, dandelion um, is also really good for early pollinators um, oh. starting yeah. to come out. And so that's uh, also another nutritious plant. Yeah, don't kill your dandelions. You're killing so many things. And you could be making, you know, you could be like milling them a bit too and getting the leaves while they're young and harvesting those to eat and then digging up the roots after the flowering process and drying them out and then roasting them and having a good dandelion root coffee. For those that want dandelion wine, they can do the recipe searching and researching, but yeah. uh, be on the coffee and it's a good anti-cancer medicine and all these things. So as yeah. long as you don't spray it with Monsanto crap, it's <laughs> like the best thing for your pollinators and yourselves. Mm -hmm. Harmony Garden so many times every year at the beginning when the dandelions come out, we can see three or three to six types of pollinators on one dandelion because there's millions of flowers on each one and they're all like, yeah. hey, let's go and party. Let's like share some nectar and pollen together and then they all kind of hang out and jive and like have a good time right instead of being like hey get off my sunflower you know? yeah <laughs> <laughs> they get territorial about sunflowers but i still say that dandelions are sunflowers in their own right but you know True. they have way more going on with them they have they so look more like a sun than a sunflower <laughs> yeah they do and they're so pretty and um, really? Maddie, you brought up a really good point in the chat. I don't know if you wanted to just say that about willows. Yeah, well, when Cease was talking about hazelnut, which was new to me, but makes total sense. Um, anything that has these early spring catkins, those are actually full of pollen. And I never thought of this before, but all, all those pussy willow catkins are also great yeah. for pollinators. So just you, you, I, 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 for some reason, I didn't think willows and pollinator food, but those are another. I you know they're the, like silent gems. Like we don't think of it, but they, all those creatures do. That's the good thing is that they, they source them. And so now that we become aware of them, we start looking yeah. and we look up a little uh -huh. bit more. That makes well, sense. The other cool thing is when you do start looking, you can actually often see so many more pollinators. I never before last year had noticed these bee queens emerging and 
in the last few weeks, I've seen several. Um, actually, the plant that I've noticed them on around here is the uh, heather that people have planted in their yards. Um, yeah, heather is a good one too, because it starts to flower early. And if you're lucky, so does uh, uh, rosemary mm -hmm. for gardener, uh, like domestic stuff, herbs, things like that. But yeah, wild stuff, it's, yeah, I think that's the biggest one is the willow and uh, hazelnut catkins that are feeding pollinators quietly over the whole winter, keeping them alive and keeping them well nourished. And uh, yeah, and they're just, they're just doing their thing. And then they, all the little catkins fall and they decompose and feed the soil. So it's all this good circle of life stuff going on in those gardens. And I love it. And um, we we're talking about elderflower today and elderberry today, see, see you and I. And um, mm -hmm. that also comes out, you know, not fairly early, but it'll be out in a few weeks, maybe with a month. So that's also another great one. And um, you know, we'll talk more about this in our Saturday event, um, but it's also an amazing, you know, plant, not only for humans, but um, for the birds and the bees, and it's like over, all over beneficial. One other thing, apart from just the berries with, with elderberry, um, they have these kind of, they have these very pithy stems, so stem nesting insects, including bees, can often make a hollow out in in the. So if you're if you hear you need hollow stems for bee habitat, that's one of the plants that you can actually use to make that happen. That's amazing. Um, okay, I'm just trying to grab the link for the Saturday event. Um, uh, for anyone who might be curious. Um, yeah, so thank you, Cease. Um, so every, or one one Saturday a month, um, Cease holds a plant profiles event where we kind of go over um, one to three different plants um, and just kind of talk about them and, and their benefits and, you know, little facts about them. And it's really awesome just to learn from Cease and all of her knowledge and wisdom. And so we just filmed that today actually. And um, yeah, so we'll be doing, um, we'll be doing huckleberry, salmonberry um, and elderberry slash flower. So um, definitely stay tuned for that. Um, I think we're gonna put the link to the um, uh, event in the chat. I'm just um, waiting for Leanne to do that because I can't exit my yeah. screen. Um, yeah, yeah, but it'll be really good. And yeah. it'll be on the, on the Facebook page, right? Yeah. 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 And then there's an event bright page that you register. I'm just getting it. <laughs> yeah. No worries. Um, so what I'm curious about Maddie and, and Cease, what are, and it might be hard to choose. So definitely you can give me a few if you want. What are some of your favorite, um, like either plants to have in your garden or pollinator plants. I mean, they could be one, obviously they could be the same, but um, you know, is it, is it ferns? Is it flowers? Is it berries? You know, you can choose multiple. I know that it's, it's hard when you love plants to just choose one, but that's my question to both of you. Well, next to succulents, which always have succulents in your garden, <laughs> but um, you know, they're always there. They're always somewhere. I also really like the Oxalis oregano, the, the really pretty redwood sorrel. It's so pretty and fluffy and lots of teeny little flowers for pollinators. And it's just fluffy green clouds. It's just really great ground cover that supports uh, the nutrients and also provides a safe place for pollinators to cool down and take a break when they're out traveling. And yeah, and they're delicious, super delicious. <laughs> I love that, I love that. I love it. Uh, what about you, Maddie? Um, oh, specific plants. I, that, that, um, talking Just about one. places for pollinators to, to rest is actually making me think not of a specific plant, but a uh, strategy, I guess, um, often being super neat and clearing out all of the stems in your garden 
actually removes a bunch of the overwintering habitat for bees and and other good insects. So if you can, if you do want to cut things back and eaten things up, the advice is to try to leave at least a foot of stock stem at the base. And um, if you're going to clean up, it's best to leave things over the winter and then do it in the spring when the temperatures are consistently, I think, above 10 degrees Celsius. So everything has had a chance to emerge. Um, and then in terms of providing more places for critters to live, um, you can kind of think in different landscape layers. So, and maybe going back to what we were talking about in terms of naturalistic planting, you can kind of think about the forest structure. So the understory ground cover and leaf litter, and then sort of the perennial understory and shrubs, and then the canopy. So kind of, how it obviously that isn't going to fit into every space that you might want to plant in you might just have a few of those in your patio garden but the more sort of structure you can provide the more space there is for for everything to to live no thank you those are some great points actually and um i think that was really nice to go into that too um, and i don't i don't i'm very bad at picking a favorite plant i know <laughs> That was great. That was um, great, actually. I love I, One I love thing that I find delightful, I, I just enjoy skunk cabbage. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they're not really the best to cultivate. They're be probably, unless you have a very moist location, better to see out in the forest. But um, they're also interesting because I think they're uh, mainly insect pollinated. So I think I'm not sure flies or beetles, anything that sort of likes a skunky carrion smell mm -hmm. gets attracted into those. Um, but I just, I like the color and the, <laughs> the color is really nice <laughs> and vibrant too. Mm. Um, I'm not sure. I feel like I, um, an elder one time told me they were medicinal as well, but I'm, I'm not completely sure on that. It of course they, they're skunk cap. <laughs> There True. Okay. Was that even a question? <laughs> Here are some amazing things that not everybody knows about the fabulous um, and not very loved skunk cabbage. And I just think I like yellow plants. Like I'm seeing that golden rod up there and thinking about the dandelion. And then we think about skunk cabbage with its pretty yellow flower. And it's so unique and strange. And it has like the flower head that looks a lot like a uh, horse tail, but, but with this yellow petal action around it, that, that if you actually snapped it would form a cup. And in that cup, if you were to pick up water and let it sit in that cup for about 15 minutes, it would purify the water in there. And then you'd have a good safety drink on the land if you were lost in the woods. So that's wow. one of the number one pretty fabulous things about it. Also, from Coast Salish um, food security and food sovereignty, the leaves, which are big and waxy, and they're not fragrant like the flower and the root. Um, they're just kind of neutral. But hey, like if anybody ever wondered how we made berry cakes, that is what we used. We used these big waxy leaves and we would spread our fruit out on there the, to dry and it would dry into these like almost granola bar sty style thickness of berries. They'd be called berry cakes. And uh, yeah, and so we use them, sit them out on a, like a little platform with some coals, maybe a foot uh, below that heat it and out in the hot sun and then the leaves can, uh, easily because they have this waxy uh, element to them the the uh, fruit doesn't stick to it it just kind of peels off right wow. and, um, it's like parchment paper but technology all the way like it's like so fascinating like everything about it and then that's just above the surface we haven't even gone below the surface to yeah. the root systems of the of the um uh, skunk cabbage and it how it's a pain reliever, especially for heavy migraines. So it's not easy to dig them up. They're really like rooted because they're a hardcore perennial that 
once they grow, they grow and they're like there. And they quite often prevent erosion from happening mm. in stream beds. They clean the water. So all animals coming there, they're wow. just like, there are different water plants like the skunk cabbage, the cattails, the wapato, swamp grass, they all clean and purify the water. So it's also like, when you see that, you know that that water is clean. So for wildlife, they're getting the freshest water when they come and drink out of there. And uh, we would have pre-contact been able to get good fresh water all over the place where these marshes are. And that's why wetlands are so, so vital. Mm -hmm. you know, they support so many living things, but they also were one of those living things they support. And it keeps the aquifers like all these aquifers we know that are under the surface, they're being purified. They, they get rained on through these marshlands that purify and go into the underground spring. If you ever wonder why are underground springs, why are these natural springs um, such clean, pure water, right? And there's no bleach in there, but they're way better. And so you don't get the bleachy taste and you also get all the minerals and nutrients of these plants that filter down and yeah wow now people pay mega bucks to have a hydroponic filtered water with water plants in their home and like you know lifestyles of the rich and famous I guess but <laughs> uh, I'm happy to have it in a local pond where we're growing these things for everything and it's also why the birds really really love to be around these wetlands because they're like oh it's the cleanest water like if we were a bird be like there's that mud puddle or that marsh with like all those great plants and I can eat some of them so I'll just go over there and like chill and get clean <laughs> you know eat some food hang out maybe chase a few bees <laughs> and that's the other thing it, it provides clean water source for the pollinators the little bees and bumblebees everything they need clean water so in everything you do it's all interconnected and all these plants are fantastic if you're doing all these things you're hitting so many marks in uh your your goals to achieve a fantastic indigenous food forest it doesn't just have to be for you food forests aren't just for people <laughs> the Anthropocene mind it's about you know especially at Maplewood Flats Wildbird Trust that's what mm -hmm. we're looking at our worldview is the pollinator first right yeah. and, and that's what we're looking at and so always leave enough animals, that's what we're doing so exactly. that's we get beautiful garden like structures in the natural world but we also can feel really good that we are seeing wildlife in action and fulfilling its need to be you know like healthy balanced that whole wellness factor like in order so yeah yeah no that's amazing oh, that and, sense. <laughs> <laughs> no I, and I completely agree Stace I think that um you know definitely when you are ever going to be out on the land and if you want to eat a berry you want to pick something always just think of you know the bees and the birds first I always try to do that because you know for every person that is coming to a bush you know five other birds are coming to it as well so or other you know 20 other bees and so it's important just to you know consider them as well and you know uh, we're technically in their territory you know we should um respect it as we should so yeah no I, I love that um, there, there is a, a question in the chat. Um, so if you want to, uh, either of you want to uh, read or, sorry, uh, respond to it. Um, Karen says, how do you start to plan a native garden? Are there sample design layouts? Good question. Well, um, you can kind of, I mean, part of that is looking at permaculture studies because permaculture is always about indigenous plants and um you know so when you when you take a walk around and look at people's gardens and see what they have I, I like to walk in different neighborhoods and see what people are planting and how many people kind of score high on the indigenous uh style plantings so for yourself you got to look at what do you have a container garden do you have a small plot how big is it what can you fit in there 
uh, find out how, you know, like you might only be able to put one shrub in there and then all small, lower growing plants, flowers and smaller shrubs like the, the Oregon grape that doesn't get too high, you know, and so things like that. And so you just start simple and always throw some stone crop in there so that it starts to become a living mulch and then think about other ground cover like Kinnick Kinnick and wild strawberry and then what can go next to it. So you go in an elevation, you start small, you can do one end, the bookends and then fill in the middle. So, oh, I'm gonna put a little red oozier over here or a plum, one or the other. Uh, you know, if you're gonna put a hazelnut, put it in a big area because like it needs about a 30, diam 30 foot diameter area for when it, and uh, it gets up to 30 feet high, but it will take up a big area and create a shade canopy in your yard if you have a yard. So if you have a yard, you're looking bigger, but always draw a map, look at what, it, what you have, and then look at, follow the sun, like how much sun and shade do you get every day? There are all these simple things you can just sit around for the next week and look at in your yard and draw, you know, and use Google Earth to take a snapshot of your yard if that's what you're working with. Or if it's your balcony, draw a little thing of it and just start thinking about what to put in there. And, and you start with five up to five plants. That way you don't overwhelm yourself and you will start to see what likes each other and then just keep going from there. You know, and if you have a big yard like that, then have more fun with it. But you, you don't need a, an elaborate yard. You, you just need containers. And one of my friends, that's all he has on his deck and that's his food garden and everything. Oh, hey, I wanted to ask you about that other picture with the corridor. Is that in Richmond? This, yeah, I think it is, yeah. <laughs> I just finished a project there, a remediation project on the site. Not for that, but I heard there was a pollinator corridor and now I get to see it, it's gorgeous. Um, but I just spent five weeks with these kids in the school, the Mitchell School nearby, mm -hmm. and we walked by the slough and they could see it needs to be remediated. And so they you know, did maps of it. And that's just what we're doing, what I'm saying to do, do a map. Mm -hmm. So they did a map of the slough and the four times we went out there, made them stand and hug those trees there. And <laughs> it was really good. Like they, the first time we went, actually they were like, couldn't stop chatting with each other. The last time, the very last day we went, it was just silence. And then they came back and they just talked really chill about what they, what they saw and heard and felt. And, um, and they made a little video about it and they made a plan to fix things up. Cause just, uh, just a little east of this image here is on in, on either end, at the very end, there's a little structure and right uh, east of this part of the picture is another, their pollinator stands and they're full of like pollinator uh, environments on a, on a kind of, uh, I don't know, didactic panel set up. And then there's a little bridge that goes over the slough and then you walk along the slough and that's where it's gotten really icky and yucky and it looks like nasty water and a lot of invasives. And so we went around and looked at what's there and what needs to be done. And every time they went after the first time they picked up garbage. So every time then, so I think they did about six walks cause they did one without me. And every time they brought their little, uh, 10 gallon buckets filled them up and and uh you know it's already looking nicer and they wrote a letter to the city of richmond to ask to remediate the site and uh and to have a budget set aside i helped them word everything where they needed help but they mostly did they 99 percent did everything themselves and and they learned so much and it was all about learning about connection to land and place and so yeah, just through observing that, they learned all that. That's and amazing. They, they could see the things that uh, would be good uh, to change, but they they knew that this corridor existed and they were describing it to me. So now it's really awesome for me to see it because it's like, okay, I can see why it's, um, you know, it's like the shape that it is. It's, this is a perfect wilded, uh, a pollinator corridor that just has multiple 
uh, things for the pollinators to eat, different colors, and they grow at different times. So it just keeps going through the whole season. So if you have big areas like that, throw lots of seed. If you're in a big yard and you have property and you have a, say you have a septic tank, you can't grow anything over it to eat, but you can throw flowers and let them just grow for your pollinators. So all these ways to kind of beautify and be a lazy gardener and <laughs> do one thing and three things happen. <laughs> um, someone um, asked, yeah. oh, sorry, I see Go ahead. Um, nope. Someone just asked if you have mainly a shaded area, lots of cedar and hemlock, what are some pollinator friendly plants that they could use? Oh yeah, well, so you saw that today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be the plant profiles that you'll get to see on Saturday. And that's red huckleberry, loves, loves, loves red cedar, salal, salmonberry. And um, of course, like I was saying, you could use in the lower parts, you could use like a mixture of kinnick kinnick and wild strawberry. They grow very well together and they cover the ground and they become a living mulch. You could also have some oxalis oregano. And if you're, um, if you're determined to find it, you can get a uh, nursery grown wild ginger and that would be really good in there. It's a really great shade plant and it has beautiful orchid like flowers. They're, the plant and the flower in total all get about this big and they go flat in the winter and then back in, in the spring they're popped up and oh, they're just amazing, 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 amazing. Awesome. Um, the other, sorry. Oh, just I, I, I don't know if this will be an option, but I have gathered three leaf foam flower seeds and planted them in the nursery this winter. So um, if they can grow from seed, that, that would be a cool plant to try and shade, but to be determined if they have any success germinating. I love yeah. that. That's I'm excited awesome. to see. But. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm excited to hear what happens with that. That's awesome. Um, Maddie, you brought up just in the chat that um, there was a teacher that was asking about, um, you know, how to get their students planting. Was that it? Um, and maybe we can just talk a, look, a little bit on that for the last few minutes. I mean, we're almost, we're almost done. I um, can't remember what the exact question was. Maddie, if you remember it. Leanne, did you have that? Is that advice for school, for what to plant at a school? Like what is a good plant to help kids learn about gardening, planting? Yeah, um, that cycles. was that, but it was definitely, we've had some inquiries. Through, well, I think uh, a, a mixture of uh, perennials and annuals, like, it's always rewarding. You learn more when you see the two. So if you start with some really young perennials, like any of the ones, we've, all the usual suspects we've already mentioned uh, and laying it out in a design manner, then any one of these, especially perennials are gonna give you the most rewards because you're like, oh, it's come back. Oh, like the salmonberry looked like a bunch of dead sticks. And all of a sudden it's just like this gorgeous, luscious, like beautiful dancing plant all the time. And, you know, it's the same with most of the, um, of those plants that, uh, you know, they, they wilt and their leaves and flowers wilt and drop off in the winter, the fall and winter, and then spring and summer, they're just like, Oh, they're so animated, you know? And so that's, it's a really good learning model. And then like wildflowers like this, they start to see the interactivity of pollinators and it all brings joy and it's all new. And then they self seed and it's like, where did the seeds go? Oh, they're back next year. And it's again, that magic. So I don't know. I mean, I like to, I like to blend things up. <laughs> like everything. I love all the plants. So you know, whatever, start, start, always start simple and then build on it, but get a couple of perennials and a couple of bags of uh, seed, flower seeds and, and go from there and then start to build on it and enjoy it. I, I was thinking about that question. Um, so there's the perennials that'll come back year after year. Um, there are also some native annuals that, um, 
if you want to plant something that kind of has a very quick germination uh, payoff, you can see something growing in just a few weeks. Um, one that we have a bunch of seeds for right now at the nursery is called Farewell to Spring because it blooms as spring is leaving in June. It has these pretty little bright pink flowers. Um, that's just an example of something that if you want something that grows quickly and blooms in the first year. But usually when you think of typical annuals, they may or may not really come back year after year. That's there's a sort of thing that you go to the grocery store and you buy a pack of things. But um, the indigenous annuals, actually their life cycle is so that they'll put all their seeds out and grow again next year. So they'll self seed. And if you if, if they're happy in a place, they can be there year after year, even though the individual plant doesn't survive beyond the first year. Um, I was going to say like a, like fireweed. It's like um, amazing for that, you know, releases all the seeds at the end of the summer. And, um, but you can also plant all the way up until like early spring, like right about now. So um, I don't know if like, you know, it takes, I think it takes a year for the plant to, to flower, but um, they're amazing. Which, so yeah. which one is the year? I thought it was um, fireweed, but they might oh, yeah, flower yeah. in the first year. Yeah. Yeah, very cool. Um, well, we're right about time. So I'll just make a few short announcements. Um, our nursery is opening up. Maddie, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about nursery opening up when you guys are planning on it and, and something like that, but. Um, currently there are plans to have the nursery open on both, I think, Saturday and April 3rd and Sunday, April 4th. And then we'll be I think announcing our regular opening hours shortly. It, usually it's from 11 to two on Saturday um, at the very least. And we'll see maybe about additional hours, but um, yeah, if you wanna drop by on Easter weekend, we should be there. Um, and there will be a bunch of new plants in um, as well as uh, probably not quite ready yet, but a bunch of seeds that we've been starting. Um, I'm really excited to check to see what has started to germinate. And some of those will be uh, are ready later in the this season too. Nice. That's awesome. And um, of course, uh, CISA's um, Plant Profiles event is this Saturday. So just a few days. And uh, Leanne put the link in the chat. So if anyone's curious, it is there. If not, you can just Google Maplewood Flats Eventbrite and um, it will definitely pop up. So for sure, um, check that out there. Leanne also left a, a ton of awesome links and resources in the chat. So, you know, definitely go look there. Um, it's, it's great. And um, yeah, so I'm super excited. Yep. She, um, put it one more time just in case anyone did miss it um and it'll be awesome so yeah no I'm really excited for both of those things the nursery opening and uh CC um event on Saturday and I just want to uh, say a huge thank you to both you Maddie and Cease um for all of your knowledge your wisdom your time uh sharing with us all your knowledge and it's been really awesome to hear and and just learn and i hope everyone uh watching from home enjoyed and yeah so i'll pass it off to you too if you wanted to say one last uh following comment plant lots of plants <laughs> everywhere <laughs> everywhere you can fit them in <laughs> even where you don't really think you can that's right and don't be if you don't know what you're doing just do it anyway how are you going to learn? That learn by doing. <laughs> don't be, you're not a master gardener master overnight. Piece. It takes takes several years, and you know once you get it down, you can say, oh, "I learned. I learned from my own mistakes." Good mistakes are good, as painful as they feel yeah. sometimes. It's really just our ego that's that pain. Not yeah. <laughs> like if you plant something and it doesn't grow, don't just not do it next year. Like if you notice pretty soon, plant another one or plant a whole bunch of something so you get some success. Like Maddie and I did some funky planting last year and 
we got a magical gift that we didn't expect. We got that monkey flower and it was like, what? It's just one, but it's they were, so they happy. Were everywhere. The, I, they have such, such tiny seeds that they yeah. were appearing in, in random locations that <laughs> yeah. surely we'd not put monkey flowers in, but. Um, but that was a gift. We, we yeah. were so blessed and it wanted to grow. So there's yeah. that. So yeah. wow. worry if you plant something that doesn't grow something else will probably appear and you'd be like oh I'm so distracted by your beauty that you know I'll just like follow you around little plant and see what <laughs> else you do so don't don't be discouraged be encouraged and have fun and make it like fun because it is yeah lovely awesome. yeah I played in the dirt today and I had a lot of fun <laughs> love yes. it soil is awesome too soil is great <laughs> Soil. Yeah, deadheading, like Maddie said, deadheading. I was doing some of that and yeah. spreading that love around the garden. I don't throw it in bags and get rid of it. I reuse it. I love it. Awesome. I love yeah. it. That's awesome. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Cease. Thank you, Maddie. Thank you, Leanne. And we hope you have an amazing night and hopefully see some of you on Saturday. All right. <laughs> right. Bye, yeah. everyone. Thank Bye. you. Bye.